February 20th Daily Video Bible Reading from the Net Bible Leviticus chapters 5 and 6 from the Old Testament When a person sins in that he hears a public curse against one who fails to testify and he is a witness, he either saw or knew what had happened, and he does not make it known, then he will bear his punishment for iniquity. Or when there is a person who touches anything ceremonially unclean, whether the carcass of an unclean wild animal, or the carcass of an unclean domesticated animal, or the carcass of an unclean creeping thing, even if he did not realize it, but he himself has become unclean and is guilty, or when he touches human uncleanliness with regard to anything by which he can become unclean, even if he did not realize it, but he himself has later come to know it and is guilty, or when a person swears an oath, speaking thoughtlessly with his lips, whether to do evil or to do good, with regard to anything which the individual might speak thoughtlessly in an oath, even if he did not realize it, but he himself has later come to know it, and is guilty with regard to one of these oaths. When an individual becomes guilty with regard to one of these things, he must confess how he has sinned, and he must bring his penalty for guilt to the Lord for his sin that he has committed, a female from the flock, whether a female sheep or a female goat, for a sin offering. So the priest will make atonement on his behalf for his sin. If he cannot afford an animal from the flock, he must bring his penalty for guilt for his sin that he has committed two turtle doves or two young pigeons to the Lord, one for a sin offering and one for a burnt offering. He must bring them to the priest and present first the one that is for a sin offering. The priest must pinch its head at the nape of its neck, but must not sever the head from the body. Then he must sprinkle some of the blood of the sin offering on the wall of the altar, and the remainder of the blood must be squeezed out at the base of the altar. It is a sin offering. The second bird he must make a burnt offering according to the standard regulation. So the priest will make atonement on behalf of this person for his sin which he has committed, and he will be forgiven. If he cannot afford two turtle doves or two young pigeons, he must bring as his offering for his sin, which he has committed, a tenth of an ephah, of choice wheat flour for a sin offering. He must not place olive oil on it, and he must not put frankincense on it, because it is a sin offering. He must bring it to the priest, and the priest must scoop out from it a handful as its memorial proportion, and offer it up in smoke on the altar on top of the other gifts of the Lord. It is a sin offering. So the priest will make atonement on his behalf for his sin which he has committed, by doing one of these things, and he will be forgiven. The remainder of the offering will belong to the priest like the grain offering. Then the Lord spoke to Moses. When a person commits a trespass and sins by strain unintentionally from the regulations about the Lord's holy things, then he must bring his penalty for guilt to the Lord, a flawless ram from the flock, convertible into silver shekels according to the standard of the sanctuary shekel for a guilt offering. And whatever holy thing he violated, he must restore, and must add one-fifth to it, and give it to the priest. So the priest will make atonement on his behalf with the guilt offering ram, and he will be forgiven. If a person sins and violates any of the Lord's commandments, which must not be violated, although he did not know it at the time, but later realizes he is guilty, then he will bear his punishment for iniquity, and must bring a flawless ram from the flock, convertible into silver shekels, for a guilt offering to the priest. So the priest will make atonement on his behalf for his error, which he committed, although he himself had not known it, and he will be forgiven. It is a guilt offering. He was surely guilty before the Lord. Then the Lord spoke to Moses. When a person sins and commits a trespass against the Lord, by deceiving his fellow citizen in regard to something held in trust, or a pledge, or something stolen, or by extorting something from his fellow citizen, or has found something lost and denies it and swears falsely concerning any one of the things that someone might do to sin. When it happens that he sins and he is found guilty, then he must return whatever he had stolen and whatever he had extorted, or the thing that he had held in trust, or the lost thing that he had found or anything about which he swears falsely. 
he must restore it in full and add one-fifth to it. He must give it to the owner when he is found guilty. Then he must bring his guilt offering to the Lord, a flawless ram from the flock, convertible into silver shekels, for a guilt offering to the priest. So the priest will make atonement on his behalf before the Lord, and he will be forgiven for whatever he has done to become guilty. Then the Lord spoke to Moses. Command Aaron and his sons, this is the law of the burnt offering. The burnt offering is to remain on the hearth, on the altar all night until morning, and the fire of the altar must be kept burning on it. Then the priest must put on his linen robe and must put linen leggings over his bare flesh, and he must take up the fatty ashes of the burnt offering that the fire consumed on the altar, and he must place them beside the altar. Then he must take off his clothes and put on other clothes, and he must bring the fatty ashes outside the camp to a ceremonial clean place. But the fire which is on the altar must be kept burning on it. It must not be extinguished. So the priest must kindle wood on it morning by morning, and he must arrange the burnt offering on it and offer the fat of the peace offering up in smoke on it. A continual fire must be kept burning on the altar. It must not be extinguished. This is the law of the grain offering. The sons of Aaron are to present it before the Lord in front of the altar. And the priest must take up with his hand some of the choice wheat flour of the grain offering and some of its olive oil and all of the frankincense that is on the grain offering. And he must offer its memorial portion up in smoke on the altar as a soothing aroma to the Lord. Aaron and his sons are to eat what is left over from it. It must be eaten unleavened in a holy place. They are to eat it in the courtyard of the meeting tent. It must not be baked with yeast. I have given it as their portion for my gifts. It is most holy like the sin offering and the guilt offering. Every male among the sons of Aaron may eat it. It is a perpetual allotted portion throughout your generations from the gifts of the Lord. Anyone who touches these gifts must be holy. Then the Lord spoke to Moses. This is the offering of Aaron and his sons, which they must present to the Lord on the day when he is anointed, a tenth of an ephath of choice wheat flour as a continual grain offering, half of it in the morning and half of it in the evening. It must be made with olive oil on a griddle, and you must bring it well soaked, so you must present a grain offering of broken pieces as a soothing aroma to the Lord. The high priest who succeeds him from among his sons must do it. It is a perpetual statute. It must be offered up in smoke as a whole offering to the Lord. Every grain offering of a priest must be a whole offering. It must not be eaten. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, Tell Aaron and his sons, this is the law of the sin offering, in the place where the burnt offering is slaughtered. The sin offering must be slaughtered before the Lord. It is most holy. The priest who offers it for sin is to eat it. It must be eaten in a holy place in the court of the meeting tent. Anyone who touches its meat must be holy, and whoever spatters some of its blood on a garment you must wash whatever he spatters it on in a holy place. Any clay vessel it is boiled in must be broken, and if it was boiled in a bronze vessel, then that vessel must be rubbed out and rinsed in water. Any male among the priests may eat it. It is most holy. But any sin offering from which some of its blood is brought into the meeting tent to make atonement in the sanctuary must not be eaten. It must be burnt up in the fire. Okay, God, you you know me. I look at <laughs> I look at things a little bit differently than some people do. And when I read the stories in the Bible, because I know they really happened, I really try and envision what it looks like. Um, you know, I have like architectural books from that time in history and things like that. And I think understanding that culture is is part of understanding the Bible and with those stories. But I'm just imagining Aaron and his sons. And a line of people with a trillion rams and tons of blood and it must have smelled horrid and they must have had they must have been full all the time from eating all those sacrifices I don't know that's just what kept running through my head is I tried to envision what this would look like 
uh, in the meeting tent. But in going, going back through the verses and getting past the kind of blood part of it, if you, before you offered your son as the ultimate sacrifice, if you were this exacting as to how we were to communicate our sin to you, I think it says, says a lot about how you want us to come before you. I can only speak for me, but sometimes, sometimes I, I definitely know I'm guilty. I know some of these were about that you're not guilty, but then you suddenly realize you are. But there's, <laughs> there's a lot of times throughout the day that I just know I'm guilty. And I catch myself sometimes just on the fly going, apologizing to the person for that situation. Um, and then apologizing to you, but it's almost like words rushed together, sentences smushed together. There doesn't seem to be a whole lot of intention for it, almost almost like I'm taking it for granted. As opposed to having to go out to my flock, find the best ram I could, um, present it in a certain way, making sure that this happens with this and this happens with this, and making sure that the priests do this, and confessing my sins on top of it. You know, I really wonder if we had to go through some sort of ritual in order to confess our sins, if we would be more intentional about it and not just take it for granted uh, that this is one of the, the many blessings that you've given us from your grace and mercy. But I do know how incredibly important this is to you, that we admit our brokenness to you. You already know everything already. It's not that we're hiding something. God, help my heart to be more intentional in talking to you. We do have some very serious conversations and we do have some very long conversations. But my brokenness and my humanness and my, my sins, let me be just as intentional with you for those as I am with everything else. Let me be just as passionate about confessing my sins to you as I am passionate about everything else I bring to you or talk to you about. I think the visual of the priest eating that offering, almost as though it's, it's going away, even, even though it's <laughs> In this version is a little bit gory. That version of the priest eating it and, and of our sacrifice to you on behalf of our sin going away, I think is a, a great visual that when we come before you, that there is a process, a humbleness that happens in our heart and an obedience that happens in our heart. That if we just do a drive by, please forgive me with you chances are we haven't learned what we were supposed to in the first place. So I thank you for stories like this, although it, at first sight or smell in this case, they seem a little bit um, icky. I have to remember the reason behind it and how, how valuable your forgiveness is. How undeserving we are of that forgiveness. And how incredibly grace-filled you are. I love you very much. <laughs> for all that you do for me. For all you've given me. And how incredibly well you take care of me. In your son's name I pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs>